Hello. Hi. Oh no, I was t- I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Yeah, I Hi. was ta- I was talking to a ghost. Um guess what, Brace? I'm not playing these games with you, but what? Guess what? What? We are not talking about the Democrats today. No, so we are, I want to let you guys know here, we are done with the Democrats. We're probably not done, but I can't fucking I don't spend another fucking little brain it. cell on them. They can suck me off. <laughs> Fuck them. I hate every single fucking one of them. I- I'll tell you what, I'm a peace and freedom party man. This is ridiculous. Oh well, except for the whole Roseanne thing. Um, <laughs> they, remember they ran a Roseanne? She should have hosted the Oscars. Oh, my God. Yeah. It would have been if her year. I want to get in touch with, like, Real America, but which I mean Can I just I mean say, it's not even in touch with people. Real America. Can I just say, like, it would have been so great to have someone there who just didn't give a fuck. Did you watch the Oscars? I did. did. Of course I did. Yeah, One, yeah. I'm a girl. Two, mm-hmm. I love an award show. Three, they call her Hollywood Liz. <laughs> no Fans, one calls, by the way, they, if you want to no talk one calls to Liz, me. call no. her Hollywood Liz. She'll respond because <laughs> she'll think you're friends with her. <laughs> no. Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm sick of Hollywood having politics. Oh, you are? It's like, you think no one gives a shit. You think pedophilia is just like non, <laughs> it's bipartisan or something? It's just no, like, I just, I don't care about what Brad Pitt has to say about impeachment. It's like, shut the fuck up. Did he talk about impeachment? He was like, I get 45 seconds tonight and that's more than John Bolton got. Ooh. And it's like, well, he shut could, the he, fuck up. Actually, in his defense... There's a little bit of ambivalence there. That could be about uh, technically about hanging John Bolton. <laughs> I just, you know, Holly Weird. Yeah. Get rid of all of them. Yeah, those are the Weinstein I mean, do, just, guys, Just right? be, look, you're rich, you're famous, you're gorgeous. Just do that. You yeah. don't have to have an opinion. Guess what? I don't care. It's like, yeah, I know. Oh, I hate, because, you know, it's for me, I can't watch stuff like the Oscars, because I know. Because you want to. No, just like a lot of the people involved in it, like I've had sort of weird stuff with. Oh god! And like it's it's you know it brings up like a lot for me. Yeah. Uh, but like Judy Dame. I yeah. Well, J- <laughs> J- J- who's Judy Dame? <laughs> Why did I say that? Dame Judy Dench. Dame Judy. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Judy Dame. Who is that's a- <laughs> This is not helping. What about me. who's the other cat? Uh, James uh, Corden. I don't know who that is either. I like him not up on stuff. I think it's fucked up that you don't remember your long, aff- the long affair you had with James Corden. James Corden? Mm. Oh yeah, I busted on his face. So what are we talking about? We are all right. So, so let's change the subject. We are talking about today. Well, we're not even talking about it today, but we're talking about it. We're, okay, wait. The, we're before that, Brace, what? I'm sorry. Let me stop talking. Go on. Welcome to Tronon. Yes. I'm Liz. My name is Mohammed bin Salman. Mm. Uh, I am the king of Saudi Arabia. Or actually, I'm still a prince of Saudi Arabia. I am joined by my faithful manservant, uh, young Chomsky, who, uh, who who carries my baggage for me and also uh, procures me various treats <laughs> from the far reaches of the empire. Uh, Liz, I am permitting to speak today. Yeah, uh, I still can't drive, though. No, no. But well, that's only because I don't actually have a driver's license. I also can't drive. <laughs> so young Chomps is technically in the driver's seat here. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so we are talking. No. Okay, okay. One more talking. thing. Oh, fucking hell, lady. <laughs> Jesus. Just a little bit of housekeeping. You're humiliating me in front of my subjects. <laughs> we have a live show coming up. Oh, yeah. Brooklyn, New York. I won't be there, but these two will be. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, March 18th, 7 p.m., sold out. Mm-hmm. If you snooze, you lose. 10 p.m., I think we still have tickets. I don't check my email, so we might. <laughs> and if we do, they can buy them. If we don't, yes. they'll be rejected. So. It's at the Bell House, somewhere in Brooklyn. I'm assuming Bushwick, maybe? It's on East 66th Street. No, no it's, it's not. not. No. Um, so we're doing that. Also, Philadelphia, mm-hmm. Sunday, March 22nd. I don't say where this one is. 
No, it's at Johnny Brenda's. I know. Okay, that's it, though. It's fish down. No! <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. Let's cut to the chase. We, okay, we've got part one mm-hmm. of a two-part, possibly three-part. Yeah, let's Explosive. not even limit. You know how, you know how like, Seth, Ab- Seth Abrams, I think, is, like, one slash... Question, question mark? mark? We're one slash question mark in this Oh, episode. yeah, good call. Because we have I a like lot that. to talk about. Yeah, um, we have had some listeners bring up in the past that they were interested in learning more about the events of September 11th, 2001. Mm-hmm. And like any good royal family, we have... Decided to say yes. Yes, we will oblige our sub- our good subjects. Mm-hmm. We are starting our part one of the True Anon 9-11 experience, mm-hmm. which doesn't sound right, but let's just go with it. Yep. We've got foremost uh, Professor Dr. Gumshoe, mm-hmm. of all gumshoes, Ben, also known as At House Trotter. Uh-huh. You should follow him. He's a good follow. AKA White Muhammad Atta. <laughs> He's coming on to red pill everyone. We're going to start this episode with a bit of uh, rich tapestry, mm-hmm. the background of leading up to the event. Like a fine Persian rug. Uh, yeah, we are, we are, we are, we are, take this as a bit of context. This is a context episode almost, and a lead up episode. Yes. Uh, because we are, uh, we are, we are very excited about this. I am. I Fucking love it. You guys don't understand. I well, maybe you do. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I have never met a tinfoil hat I didn't like. No, no nor no. one that didn't look great on me. Yeah. Oh, shapely head. <laughs> I look great in hats. Yeah, and without. Thank you, Brace. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. The day is upon us. Liz? I'm here. Are you excited? I am. I'm ready, baby. Oh, yeah. We've got a, uh, we've got, well, by this point, we should have done an intro, although we'll record that after. But we have (laughs) a hell of an episode for you today. We are joined by the one and only House Trotter, Ben, that is Ben at House Trotter Trotter on Twitter, to talk about everything from Afghanistan to Anthrax, to Mika Brzezinski. Uh, and everything in between. Everything in between. So, Ben, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, absolutely. So, let's, let's just dive right in. What, we're, talking, we're talking about Afghanistan, but we're also talking about West Asia, Southwest Asia. Why? Yeah, well, uh, if we want to start, the only history I know basically starts in 1945. Uh, mm-hmm. So, if we want to start there... Um, you know, the whole, the whole point of Southwest Asia, the whole point of America wanting to have control over Southwest Asia goes back to the British uh, wanting to have control over Southwest Asia for basically the same reasons. Uh, oil uh, and the whole, the whole plan around sort of having, having this relationship with Saudi Arabia, which will play yeah. very heavily into the 9-11 story, uh, really has its roots in that. Uh, and there was a security arrangement that Roosevelt set up uh, with the Saudi royalty to sort of it, basically in exchange for the United States guaranteeing protection for the royal family, not just Saudi Arabia in general, but the royal family very specifically uh, from threats both externally and internal. The idea was in exchange for that, the United States was going to get oil and, and access to this oil. Uh, and our, our first Rockefeller connection was that they basically picked Saudi Arabia because uh, a Rockefeller descended company had the rights to the oil in Saudi Arabia already, so ah. it was very easy to sort of make that arrangement. It's scary when, uh, like, you know, you find out little details like that that feel so arbitrary, and it's completely and totally altered the course of history. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, right, it, and you know, obviously, if it had been, if Iran had been more important uh, than than you know, the nineteen seventy nine revolution would have been, probably wouldn't have happened. The United States probably would have invested a lot more. Uh, in securing that, uh, which I think is basically why there's never been anything similar in Saudi Arabia. Well, the, I know I, it's, there was there was that you know there were those those revolutionaries in the 60s and 70s on the Arabian yeah, Peninsula, totally. PFLOAG and stuff, which is yeah. probably going to be the worst name for a revolutionary. <laughs> 
P flag. But uh, yeah. and they they you know they fought pretty well. But in Saudi Arabia, there they did not have much of a chance whatsoever. It was mostly yeah. in like Oman, the sort of more uh, provincial right. parts of the, the peninsula. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 so that 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 sort of agreement between the Saudi royal family and Roosevelt really set the stage for this kind of like relationship basically where where they provided us with oil we provided them with protection but they also did like it's it's very similar to like mafia type relationships because they did a bit they do a bit of dirty work for us as well oh yeah absolutely and i, I definitely when we start talking about 911 i think the gid uh and the isi also which is the pakistani intelligence agency uh did a lot of off the books things that uh, helped to obs- i mean there's basically a lot of the 911 stuff there's no paper trail yeah. And a lot of that is right. because the GID did a lot of it, the ISI did a lot of it, uh, and they have no paper trail that's accountable to, for example, Congress. Yeah. Uh, so there's really nothing to yeah. find. Yeah. I mean, and Pakistan, so for those of you, for our, for our zero IQ listeners, uh, which are the ones that like Liz that are listening, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Afghanistan is located sort of in, in this area above Pakistan, below Russia, in, in what's called Central Asia a lot. Right, I mean, mm. I would say Afghanistan, Central yeah. Asia. I guess, yeah, I guess Central, Central Asia. Central Asia. Um, and it is, it is a very mountainous country, but it's, it's been sort of this, uh, it's been fought over for a long time. I mean, because uh, as many people know, Britain controlled all of India, which before the partition, um, and that sort of area along the Afghani uh, Indian border was basically where they sent to train a lot of their troops, because there was always sort of fighting going on there with. Uh, you know, whoever was, you know, peasant rebellions, et cetera. Uh, and it's, it's crazy. It's still, it's still kind of like that today. It's kind of where America trains its troops. Um, but it is, it is sort of strategic because in, in, you know, as and many people have heard, you know, maybe references in, in literature and media to like the great game between Russia and, and the British Empire. And, uh, you know, part of the, a big part of that was, was Afghanistan as sort of a corridor to India. And and a, a place where where trade flowed through, and so there's been a lot of sort of big country attention on this little country for a long time. And I mean, definitely going going forward, it it also was a, a gateway to the Caspian. Yes, Afghanistan gateway to the Caspian. Yes, 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 yes. The post Cold War world, Afghanistan is a very important. Uh, it borders a lot of the Soviet Turkic republics in Central Asia, uh, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan. Um, so these were, these were important for that, those purposes, which we may talk about later. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's really, it's, there's been a long sort of weird relationship. Well, not that long considering Pakistan hasn't been a country for that long, but Pakistan yeah. and Afghanistan have a pretty weird relationship too, where they basically, uh, at, at certain points have funded essentially like peasant rebellions or these sort of jacqueries. On, on each other's side of the border, particularly Pakistan sort of stirring up trouble in Afghanistan. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's even become a part of the Pakistan-India conflict. There's, yep. there's a lot of Indian influence in Afghanistan as well for that reason. It's definitely a, a battlefield for multiple different, uh, multiple different conflicts, much to the... Uh, it, really, it really sucks to live there. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of times people trying to invade for various reasons. Exactly. I mean, there's yeah. been decades straight of war at this yeah. point. So, so let's yeah. go through quickly this little timeline we wrote up. So, just we'll start in the '70s. So, in '71, Pakistan, uh, they. It used to be two Pakistans. I'm not going to go too far into this, but there was East Pakistan and West Pakistan. East Pakistan was sort of the more dominant force. They were actually. West Pakistan was an exclave. It was on the all the way on the other side of India. It's what now, is now known as Bangladesh. In seventy one, uh, basically due to a regional politicians gaining more prominence and more seats in the the parliament, East Pakistan essentially invades West Pakistan and commits basically a genocide. Kissinger backs them, but uh, the State Department goes behind his back and cuts off aid, which is important because we'll get to we'll get to stuff about this later. And in 73, the king of Afghanistan is overthrown by his cousin, which, much respect, uh, a guy named Daoud Khan, and uh, who turns into a republic. And then uh, Soviet aid starts forthcoming, uh, the Communist Party gains more prominence, and in 70, uh, excuse me, in 79, or 78, the Sour Revolution happens, and the, the Communist Party in Afghanistan overthrows the, uh, 
the 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 king's cousin. And America is not very happy about this, right? Yeah, I mean, this was kind of uh, the beginning of you know, Brzezinski is now uh, apart from being Mika Brzezinski's dad. Uh, he's, I mean, he's kind of hailed as a hero, like very mainstream accounts paint him as the person who p- helped bring the Soviet Union down for pulling them into their own Vietnam. Yep. Um, and that was the idea. I mean, he was, uh, he was kind of the originator of this idea of let's try to draw the Soviet Union into a war in Afghanistan and that's going to bog them down. That was the, that, I mean, that's the conventional story. I think there's a lot more to it than that, but that's, that's the conventional story about what happened. Just really quick for our listeners, do you want to explain who Brzezinski is? Yeah. So he was, he was Carter's uh, national security advisor. He's like an old Rockefeller guy. Mm. This whole, this whole period between uh, Nixon, well, really from Nixon to Reagan is a basically a huge power struggle between the sort of Rockefeller foreign policy, which I think is represented best by Kissinger, but also by Brzezinski, mm-hmm. uh, versus what would become the neocons, Cheney, right. Rumsfeld, uh, Wolfowitz, Scowcroft, those, those people. Uh, and they kind of traded off. Like in the Ford administration, they became more powerful. And then Brzezinski was back in, in 76 with Carter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was very similar. I mean, they, <laughs> they very much followed up on each other's plans. So Brzezinski begins his plan to let's fund these it originally started off just being people in, already in Afghanistan who were yeah. not, for various reasons, not happy with um, this new government. Um, and that started to pull Soviet attention to Afghanistan. Um, I don't know much about it from the Soviet side of things, but I'm assuming, like the U.S., they probably had uh, all kinds of special forces and, and yeah. spies involved already. Uh, and eventually, by the, by the mid-'80s, it turned into a uh, full-blown Operation Cyclone where... I mean, that's that's where the Mujahideen comes from. Uh, that uh, that movie with Tom Hanks is that congressman. Yes, oh, I never funding, saw it. Yeah. I never I didn't saw either, that. I didn't either, but I'm I think sort of it's, surprised. I, it's based on Charlie Wilson's War, this book. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, which, again, very much <laughs> does not does not do a lot to illuminate what actually did happen. No. Um, but yeah, the idea was let's. Uh, I mean, by the mid '80s, under under obviously Reagan became president through uh, suspicious circumstances involving Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. October surprise. His, yes, the October surprise, uh, and he his campaign manager was was William Casey. Sure. Uh, who was a uh, uh, very close to H. W. Bush? <laughs> we'll probably talk about a lot more. Yes. Um, and Bill Bill Casey's became the CIA director, uh, which mm-hmm. first off, everybody at the time was uh, kind of appalled by that, the idea that this very political person who had been running a campaign would become the CIA director. But people didn't really understand it. Yeah, it kind of like um, violated a lot of like uh, like bureaucratic <laughs> norms. norms. Yeah, totally, yeah, totally, which is such a weird, funny thing to say, but it was like seen as a... Um, Politicization, yeah, politicization like a of politicization, like the- but also like breaking ranks. I mean, because it's the whole idea is that these guys train to move up in these positions, and it was seen as like a reward for. I mean, clearly, kind of what he managed to pull off. Well, if yeah. anyone, yeah, yeah. I mean, if anyone knows about the CIA, it's HW. So, <laughs> well, exactly, and I mean, obviously, the CIA is completely interlinked with, uh, especially the the Houston oil. Mm. financial elite that H.W. Uh, is a, a key member of. Once Casey came in, um, he really started to, to really push that. Um, and they used, they used their, their key allies, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and started raising this uh, militia, this Afghan Arab Mujahideen, that would go fight in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's, that's really what took the war to the next level. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously people are going to be unhappy, and, and it's as far as you're funding them. They're going to have the arms to do something. But when you start raising a military outside the country to go fight, uh, it, it really pushed things to the next level. Yeah, let's pause for a second and talk a little bit about the Mujahideen. And I think, uh, I don't, I mean, I know that that gets thrown around a lot. I don't know how much our listeners or people understand, like, how vast this program was. Oh, it was huge. I mean, so, so Mujahideen, for those of you who are not, I, so for instance, I am technically a secular Mujahideen. <laughs> Because I went on secular jihad. <laughs> but a mujahideen means one who engages in jihad in Arabic. And by the way, we, we'll, get to, we'll get to some of that later. Uh, a lot of the people that were coming to, to Afghanistan to fight 
were not themselves like, you know, uh, dissident Afghanis who had been out of the right. country, but they were what was called Afghan Arabs. And of course, not all of them were, were Arabic, or excuse me, not all of them were Arabs to begin with in the first place. Um, but the Mujahideen were, were, were this essentially this force that was raised both internally in Afghanistan and then externally in Pakistan and then in Saudi Arabia and other sort of... Uh, uh, countries that were Muslim-dominant countries that were allied with the U.S. It is, there are both Shia and Sunni uh, Mujahideen uh, who do not always get along. Um, but it, uh, it was, it was at, at one point, I mean, they were raising a seriously full-on armies uh, just on the border in these refugee camps right outside uh, on, the, on the Pakistani-Afghan um, uh, border. And, and Brzezinski, there's actually footage of both Brzezinski and uh, one of the one of the most notorious thoughts in history, Margaret Thatcher, addressing <clears throat> the Mujahideen on the border there, which is just, I mean, in, in context, pretty wild. But not all Mujahideen, it, it wasn't all, I think a lot of people think that Mujahideen directly all became Al-Qaeda, uh, <clears throat> which I'm yeah. going to increasingly pronounce in more insane Al ways. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. <laughs> uh, in more insane ways in an attempt to sound smarter as this episode goes on. <laughs> Uh, but no, there was a lot of different of these groups. I mean, I mean, yeah. it was there was there was there was a ton, and they engaged in in both like uh, interceding. I do not think I pronounced that correctly. The kind of warfare where you kill your friends too. Interceding, intercening, internicing. Internicing. Damn, first time saying that and not reading. <laughs> internicing war uh, <laughs> warfare and against the Soviets. Right. Uh, and and at first, so this aid starts in. Uh, in 79, right after the Sour Revolution, with, with non-lethal aid, quote-unquote, which is, by the way, the same kind of non-lethal aid that they gave al-Qaeda in Syria. Right. Uh, <laughs> but they were already, I mean, the... the, the they the, were already familiar with the program. Yes, so yeah. They're like, oh, get I them. remember this. <laughs> um, but, but the ISI, the Pakistan, Pakistani Security Services, and the Saudis, they had already been fun, funneling lethal aid to the rebels, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the ISI... Um, and we we could we haven't touched on drugs yet, but no, there, I know there was I was already, <laughs> yeah. Th so there was already a lot of drug running, go a lot of drug production happening in both Afghanistan and also the border region of Pakistan. What drugs? Um, uh, opium, heroin. Yes, I know. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The good one. Um, one one other thing I I you know I mean this because this. Uh, one of the parts of the popular history of this is that this was spurred by the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan. That that's, yes. that that's when mm -hmm. it started. And that's not the case at all. Uh, no. Brzezinski said in, in an interview in 98 uh, that, they, that they, the United States began funding groups in Afghanistan before the Soviet Union invaded uh, with the belief that it would cause the Soviet Union to invade. I mean, that was the, that was the whole point of this yeah. program to begin with. Um, yeah, it was a bait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And and they took the bait, and it and it worked by all by all indications. Um, yeah. But the 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 uh, definitely Pakistan and definitely Saudi Arabia were already involved. So it was not it was not a, a huge lift for the United States to start uh, getting involved themselves. And and they did all kinds of weird. I mean, selling them quite advanced uh, Stinger anti air missiles. Uh, sending them anti-air guns, like pretty heavy, heavy weaponry. Even uh, I think after the first, I don't remember when exactly it was, but they definitely sent Iraqi captured Iraqi tanks to Afghanistan oh, wow. at one point. Uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, the, they were dealing with heavy, pretty heavy equipment. Um, I mean, maybe we, should we start talking about the drug? The I was drug just going to say, like, maybe well? right now is a good point to mention before we kind of get into, you know, uh, more of the Soviet. Uh, you know, intervention. Maybe we should talk about the drug running. Let's talk about drugs, baby. <laughs> All right. Welcome to bluelight.com forum radio. That's a drug forum I used to is it? Yes, it is. It's still extant, I believe. Uh, yes. So we have someone who isn't me here to talk. That's the slang they use on drug forums. Someone, they say someone who isn't me. Right. To refer to right. themselves. Anyways. My friend. Ben, lay, lay on, lay me on, lay on some, some opium to this jive turkey over here. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, I mean, uh, this is a, a nice confluence of probably the two most important commodities to the economy, which is oil and drugs, Yep. Uh, and, and especially heroin, which is uh, quite easy to grow, quite easy to produce, and very profitable. Um, so, I mean, like you get billionaires in any business or, or very rich, powerful people who can control uh, the way that the government works uh, in the drug industry, you get these people. Uh, particularly in countries on the, the margins, countries like Pakistan, 
uh, where, yeah, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the people who were, for example, regional governors were were straight up protecting drug traffickers, taking a cut of the drug mm-hmm. trade. Uh, I mean, it does look. You, you mentioned mafia. I mean, it definitely does look uh, a lot mm-hmm. like a, a sort of a protection racket. It's very uh, similar to what was happening in like Laos in, in the early seventies as well. Absolutely, and and in a lot of ways, actually, was a direct continuation of that whole. Yeah. Program. I mean, the the idea of using uh, drug it, drug funds to fund a militia uh, is definitely something that was prototyped in Vietnam. Not even Absolutely. prototyped. I mean, was was quite successful in Vietnam. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I mean, some of the I mean, one of the people uh, who shows up both at this time and then later uh, as part of the so-called Northern Alliance uh, that helped the United States invade Afghanistan in two thousand one was Gulban Hekmatyar. Yes. Um, yeah, he's a de- definitely Pete Buttigieg worked for him. Oh, he <laughs> he was like, I mean, he was, I mean, at one point I think he was just being openly and directly paid by ISI, but he was, I read this yeah. book by William Volman. Do you know who he is? No, no, I don't. Uh, he is like a very psychotic, like kind of outsider art, to, not really, mm-hmm. but he's like a, a, mm. a real freak writer, one of my favorite writers. But in his youth, he traveled to Afghanistan to join the Mujahideen. He's from like Sacramento and he's like a little skinny guy who like saw all these pictures of orphans and stuff and was like, I want to join them. And his, he wrote a book about getting diarrhea on, uh, uh, in the Khyber Pass and never actually be, it's basically like a really self-effacing book. Like I'm a fucking idiot. This is insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, but he's like, he talks about his run-ins with Gulbuddin's people and it's, it's, mm. it's very entertaining, but yeah, Gulbuddin yeah. is, was the warlord of warlords pretty much, right? Oh yeah. He was definitely the top. And, and, you know, most of the people, uh, who were involved in the drug trade, uh, Haqqani also, yep. uh, got to start at that time. Of the most Haqqani of the people, network. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But most of the people, uh, who were doing that sort of thing were mostly trading sort of raw opium and it was going elsewhere to be processed. Yeah. Uh, but Hekmatyar actually had processing. Uh, himself and, and was able to take that much more, that much more money. He was scaling. Um, he knew how to scale up. Oh yeah, he was. He was a girl boss. <laughs> McKinsey like, would be short. would be proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he might have gotten tips. Yeah, get some business school, some Harvard Business School people in there. Uh, yeah, and and I mean this this beca- I mean this remains a super important. I mean obviously Hekmatyar mm-hmm. uh, b- became very important to the to the two thousand one invasion. So I definitely mm-hmm. the drugs. The drug networks are a, a huge part of this, uh, for sure. I mean, we should mention that too. Like, you know, the the opium production out of Afghanistan has not ceased. I mean, that is well, still very mm-hmm. much. Ironically, it did at some points. Like, it did. Did the Taliban kind of shut it? Yeah, but obviously not. Not totally. I mean, right. that's. I think that's sort of been a little overblown about how much they like shut it down because they. I mean, if Syria has taught us anything, is that 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 if you are not uh, you know a hardcore Orthodox you know Wahhabist, you will still sell dope. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, famously, there's pictures of U.S. troops walking around protecting mm-hmm. opium fields and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the D. I mean, obviously, the DEA is corrupted in its own way, but there oh, yeah. are, there are definitely instances of DEA agents complaining about uh, certain people being protected by the State Department or uh, by other agencies. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, and 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 it's it's we should we should say again like so the the CIA or the the U.S. government, but the CIA in particular, using drug profits that they take from sort of these regional warlords and refine. I mean, you know, Gulbuddin could refine it there, but often refined in Europe, in France, mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. of the time, Marseille, uh, and using the funds from that to purchase weapons for militias they equip, or to to purchase explosives for terrorist groups in, mm-hmm. for example, Italy. Uh, mm-hmm. Is is I mean there is absolutely no reason to think that they've stopped this and they've they've also moved. No, into it's like a big too. black market money laundering scheme because yeah. it yeah. it's like just basically controlling an entire black market to move drugs into weapons into drugs into weapons to control like conflicts from all sides. Basically. Yeah, and 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 also just like it it uh it it lets you fund off the books operations. You know, if you yeah, have an totally. unaccountable black market you know source of funds. Then nobody can FOIA it, or like mm-hmm. you know, no, no, no uh, coked up senator can can figure it out. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, so they were they were actually getting some advanced weaponry too. I mean, some of the some of the weapon systems that the Taliban received. I mean, you're talking about the tanks, but they they famously received Stinger missiles. Uh, and and I yeah, think the sort of prototype yeah, man pads. They got they got stingers and. And a lot of those found their way elsewhere and were used in other conflicts as well. Sure. Uh, I mean, a lot of this, like the ISI 
was the intermediary for a lot of the weaponry, mm-hmm. and they just kept a lot of it for, yeah. for whatever they. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> Yeah, right. you gotta yeah. kill. You gotta kill your prime minister at some point. I mean, you, have, not, you gotta have eyes on everyone. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, why would you just be like, sure, I'll just run these over to you without? Yeah. Oh, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Well, and the army, the army in Pakistan is is sort of the, uh, the 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 prominent force in that country to begin with. Right. So, uh, but yeah. So I mean, they they had a pretty good um, they had a pretty good run funding this Mujahideen. I mean, they were very successful. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, they they did what they wanted to do. I mean, they pulled the Soviet Union into a, a costly war for them. Um, there, there. I mean, the Soviet Union wanted to get out. Uh, yeah. And one of the one of the things that that made it very difficult for them to get out uh, is that Casey sort of went even further and escalated beyond where he had been, uh, which is they started to plan. And, they, and there started to be raids across into the USSR proper. Oh wow! Uh, from, from, Afghanistan from Afghanistan into the Soviet Union. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, into into those Turkic republics in in sort of central Central Asia, uh, and this obviously this was not something that the Soviet Union was was okay with. It. So it it became very difficult for them to leave for that reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. I uh, mean, th- there's long been sort of. I mean, the the West has long been fascinated with the uh, with the peoples of Central Asia, but but this is all like, I I know that sort of stirring up trouble in those republics has been been a plan from various different countries for a while to sort of neutralize and to get to get the USSR tangled up, uh, you know, sort of fighting its own people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And literally, do not get me started about Turkey. I, I, we could go on about Turkey for <laughs> the a The country time. Turkey? It's, yes, the, you, the country Turkey. You might yeah. be surprised to find that I'm, I, I am also not a fan myself. <laughs> <laughs> not, you know, not the people, not the, you know, but the... Uh, yeah, of course. The, yeah. I mean, the, talk the, about the, deep states. Well, that's where the term comes from, is... is uh, is uh yeah the Susserlick incident? Yeah, yes, yeah, and the, and what was that? Was that was that the car crash? Was it was that, a car crash yes. that yeah one of the people was a, a regional police chief. Yes, uh, one of the people was a member of I don't remember if it was the Turkish parliament or a, or a regional parliament, and then one of the people was a was a top top heroin dealer. Yeah. And so they find these people in this car. Like, what is going on? Why <laughs> yeah. Would this, well, why that, would these people be together? From that stems like all. I mean, if you talk to a like a Turkish left winger, I mean, oh yeah. Every like, there are so many. I mean, that really put some weird stuff into that movement. There, there's like talk about one of the biggest terror groups there, sort of being uh, not terror groups, like left wing sort of communist militant group, DHKPC. Uh, they a lot of people think that they are controlled entirely by MIT, the Turkish Intelligence Service. It's, we'll have to do a whole episode about that because it is some crazy <laughs> shit. I hang out with like a lot of old Turkish or a few okay. old Turkish Stalinists who uh, sure. have very, very strong opinions about this kind of stuff. Um, well, yeah. to get back on what we were saying about dark money mm-hmm. and all the, it's not really even dark money, but all the off the books funding and markets that the CIA yeah. know, runs. They need it. They need banks, don't they? Yeah, let's talk BCCI, Ben. Oh boy, yeah, BCCI. Um, because this is another big force in the story that we're kind of, or the painting, the tapestry that we're weaving mm-hmm. as the background to, you know, the events leading into nine eleven, the yep. invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan mm-hmm. in two thousand one. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, definitely BCCI is uh, part of a long string of financial organizations that uh, are kind of the glue that holds the whole thing together. I mean, it, you need to get money from opium to politicians in the West. I've right? been somehow. saying that. It, it has to happen somehow. And BCCI was sort of the, the way that that and it went through all kinds of convoluted, but it basically was a giant money laundering uh, scheme that took... Uh, chiefly drug money, but but also arm, illegal arms sales and that sort of thing, uh, and was a way for that money to move around. Uh, yeah, like I said, including to a lot of politicians in the United States, uh, a lot of politicians in the Gulf as well as in Pakistan, uh, and it was it was kind of the key conduit. Yeah, just to be clear to our listeners who don't know what this is, so BCCI stands for Bank of Credit and Commerce International. It was literally a bank, like it was a bank mm-hmm. like any other bank. Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't a bank like any other bank. I mean, like, it looked like a bank like any other right, bank. Right, But it was basically what you would call, like, a CIA cutout. I mean, it was yeah. just, um, like you said, it was a way for them to funnel 
uh, you know, they had to funnel all the money and, and drug money and off the book money in and out, uh, you know, to, to various, like you said, various politicians, various, you know, actors, but they needed something that, um, you know, made it kind of look reputable. Um, yeah. And it was, I mean, it was investigated, um, as if it was a normal bank. Uh, you know, there was a Kerry that was yeah, one of the our good that Kerry investigated. Our good friend John Kerry. <laughs> our good friend John Kerry, uh, who definitely, I mean, a lot of the report is definitely a whitewash. And there's right. also a lot of good stuff in there that's very interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was nominally just a regular, a regular old bank and lots and lots of people, including the Bushes. Uh, you know, it had it had some involvement in the savings and loan crisis in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, it you know it had tendrils that went that went really everywhere. Uh, and now, I mean, a lot of that stuff is basically legal. So, right. Yep. Uh, a lot of the you know a lot of the very mainstream banks get slapped with fines all the time for uh, laundering money for for drug cartels. Uh, and that's you know that that in the past had to be done completely below board, uh, and now is in kind of a gray zone effectively. Uh, but there's also groups like Carlisle um, that also help connect those, oh, those elite politicians. Oh, yes, Ugh, yes, they the do. Carlisle group. Uh, um, so the Bush family has pretty deep connections to BCCI, right? Yeah, and they, uh, I, I could go down, we could talk for probably three hours about George H.W. Bush. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but he, you know, the there's this whole Houston oil mm-hmm. elite Yes. Uh, that includes Bush, that includes his dad. You know, his dad was, was making money in, in Germany uh, during the Nazi times. Alan Dulles was helping him hide that money. Oh, so I knew goes, Alan Dulles did a lot of sort of financial wrangling for, let's oh, just yeah, say, yeah. not just the Allied side on that <laughs> war. Oh, certainly. I, Truman called him a traitor. I mean, Truman, Truman straight up called him a traitor in the newspaper one time. Jesus, um, fuck. Yeah, wow. and Prescott Prescott Bush was a pretty senior person. This is yeah. H. W. Bush's father. Was a pretty senior person in uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, which is a big uh, uh, early investment bank at this time. So this is, I mean, this goes way back. This kind of involvement in this uh, dark, not even dark money, it's theoretically legal, but uh, going all kinds of weird dark places. Um, yeah, and and Bush had some pretty direct connections to uh, a lot of Gulf. In particular, Saudi money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, via this guy Jim Bath. No, we got some stuff on Bath, but let's just let's let's talk about Bush's oil stuff real quick. Yeah, I think we need to like um, give our listeners a, just a, maybe a short. I mean, you did a good job, but just like a short history of the Bush. I mean, not if you can give a short history of the Bush family, <laughs> you can't really. But just so people yeah. understand, because I, I feel like. Especially for um, people who are maybe younger or newly politicized or feeling newly politicized, like, um, you know, the Bushes have kind of receded from public. Yeah. Uh, they're the memes. Public now. profile. Yeah, they're memes, or, you know, it's not even just the like goofy Ellen stuff with George W. Bush, but like God. even the idea of the Bush dynasty is yeah. like mm-hmm. kind of re- like been erased from public memory because well, there's still this there's still this sort of thing where like trump is this uniquely evil person where yeah. it's like i mean trump is incredibly he's a horrible person he's evil but like this stuff is much more i don't know it, this stuff makes you go more insane like trump yeah, charging secret totally. service 650 dollars a night for his hotel room like yeah obviously that's corrupt and bad this stuff that is like does yeah that pales in comparison to like w- anything 9/11? that the Bush family <laughs> yeah. has touched like even like you mentioned Prescott Bush like going back and back and back like this oh, yeah. dynasty is like I I just like feel like we don't even properly appreciate the like <laughs> well because when I was young, of this when family. the Iraq War started I was I was pretty young but I remember very vividly at the I time I was eight. Just yeah, kidding. yeah. No, I, li- I took Liz there on my knee as a baby. Uh, but but I, you know, the, at the protests and all these things, I remember very vividly uh, a big thing running through it is that Bush has financial ties to what is going on. That Cheney mm-hmm. is, of course. I mean, mm. I found out. You know, I was twelve and I was like telling kids at school about like Kellogg uh, and <laughs> shit. Like I was like, hey, check this yeah. out. Um, and. And I think that sort of receded more where it's like become almost a meme like, oh, yeah, no blood for oil. They're doing it for oil. Like, no, they like literally yeah. it was for oil for them. Yep. Like and and I mean, for their friends as well. But like, give, yeah, give us a little history of the Bushes. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right. You, you mentioned 9-11. Like, I mean, H.W. Bush has some pretty close ties to the JFK assassination as well. Like, it's... Yeah, like I mean, maybe, uh, is, speak on it, sis. Speak on yeah, it. Maybe he did yeah. it. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's a lot of... So, all, I want to say, first off, I have not written any books. All of this is just from books that I've read. But definitely a book about the Bushes that people should read is Russ Baker's uh, Family of Secrets. Which mm, yes. Is excellent. Basically, everything I'm about to say is, is just cribbed straight from that book. Um, but the, yeah, so the Prescott Bush stuff going all the way back to the Nazis. Um, but HW, uh, was, uh, part of that whole Yale thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, the whole, I mean, the skull and bones, everybody has this idea of it's like the, it's like the Illuminati, but it's just a club of, of basically the sons of rich people who get together and that's all again. And that's what, uh, that's what H.W. Bush was very, very good at doing. Uh, he very famously, he would send out Christmas cards to like 3,000 people or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. Pathetic. And it was, it was really useful. I mean, he knew people everywhere, and it served him really well. Um, so very early on, he, he, there was this oil company, Zapata Oil, um, that by all appearances was just a CIA front. Um, it was very closely associated with uh, another an oil services company uh, that later emerged with Halliburton very interestingly, mm. called Dresser Industries. And that was run by a guy named Neil Mallon, who was very close with Alan Dulles. Uh, and, and Neil Mallon is, is who Neil Bush is named after, so obviously very close to H.W. Bush. Weird. Um, so there's this very clear connection already back at this point in time, this is like the 50s, Yeah. Uh, between intelligence and oil, uh, and then later, a little bit later, finance. Um, mm-hmm. Well, that's uh, but not, the not intelligence even later. guys. I mean, Prescott was definitely. Fine. I was about to say all the intelligence guys. I mean, I mean, the OSS was basically all Wall yeah. Street lawyers. Mm-hmm. And totally. Then, of course, I mean, the- uh, you know, Alan Dulles was basically brought into the OSS to protect various people's uh, because people like Prescott had been investing in uh, sometimes illegal and sometimes not necessarily illegal uh, German industry, and they didn't yeah. they didn't really want people to know about this. Uh, so they placed certain people like Alan Dulles uh, in positions in the OSS to, to kind of protect this money. Uh, and that obviously he, he <laughs> knew a lot of very important people, yeah. which led to him becoming uh, very powerful. Uh, but yeah, right. I mean, Alan Dulles was a lawyer for uh, 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 a lot of different finance firms, uh, groups like the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> which, which, which yes. is obviously very important. Very uh, important. To, to what the CIA did in in uh in iran i mean they basically overthrew uh masada yeah for for oil money essentially yeah. i mean just for straight up for the oil rights um for other reasons as well but that was a huge part of it and yeah hw was grew up in this right i mean he, he mm-hmm. was raised in this in this uh milieu of people uh to use dave emery's favorite word and <laughs> he he yeah he just became kind of the the favorite son and carried it on to uh, all kinds of shady deals. I mean, obviously, we could talk about his involvement in Iran Contra, in uh, the October Surprise, and getting mm-hmm. rid of Nixon. I mean, he pops up again and again and again. And uh, and he's always, you know, he always stays in the background. Obviously, until he becomes the president, right? Uh, but he's he's present for all of these things and is calling the shots on a lot of them. Yeah, he's like much more of a shadowy figure than people give him credit for. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was a spy. That was what he did. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Was literally, his job was spy. Yep. Yeah. And also, no one knows what he was doing in Dallas on the day JFK was shot, and he refuses to say. Is that correct? He does not. He says he doesn't remember. Yeah. Which and there's a, is, no yeah, one a, remembers where they were that day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was it's, reading so books to children yeah. at a school in Florida. <laughs> That's right. Somebody whispered in his ear. Yeah. yeah. There's a so there is a there is a letter that Barbara Bush supposedly wrote on the day uh, that is in her uh, her memoir, and it literally it literally she starts the letter before JFK is killed, and she finishes the letter as JFK is dying, and talks about how awful it is. It's it's beyond parody. The letter itself it's just ridiculous. It's obviously meant to provide an alibi for for right. it, it describes where he was and what they were doing and all of this. God, it's, she's such a fucking ridiculous. bitch. Yeah, I, I really hate her. <laughs> I know. I, I didn't want to say anything because I, I fucked her. I can but, say it. I'm a woman. It's yeah. fine. Well, no. I mean, I just... I'm just I've, saying, woman to woman, I don't like her. Yeah. I, I have like a weird history with her, and I would really rather we yeah, move okay. on from her in particular. But. Okay, so we've talked right, a little sure. about... Also, George, uh, George W. Bush's wife killed somebody. 
Really? Did she? I what? didn't know that. No, he did. No, she did. She ran someone over. Oh, I damn. thought he did. Laura Bush killed somebody. Hold on. Let me Google this real quick. <laughs> no, Laura I Bush thought... killed somebody. I thought... Bam! Laura Bush killed somebody. <laughs> wow. There Great we go. Google search result there. Yeah, she killed her best friend. Very cruel. Don't look up I how. Thought... Oh, God. <laughs> um, sorry. Really quick. Back to HW. Because... Um, you know, you had, you know, we started the episode. Um, I know we're like going all over the place, but I, that's how we like to do true. But and wrong. also, this is all related. So, Absolutely. it's all the same topic. No, I love it. But I do want to just mention because we did start the episode talking about um, kind of how the United States, um, particularly United States business interests, started with Saudi Arabia. And the relationship between the Bushes and the Saudis is, is like very important. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so, can you give a little brief kind of intro to that? Yeah. So I mentioned Jim Bath very br- briefly earlier, um, but but Jim Bath is kind of the key intermediary between uh, the Bushes and the Bin Laden family in particular, actually. Hmm. Uh, and I and m- maybe people don't know much about the Bin Laden family. Oh, so uh, 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 so Osama that, Bin Laden. Perhaps they've heard of him. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Bin Laden of- family is fucking huge. No, I know. Yes. I'm just making a yes. joke. Yeah, I mean, my man was nutting and busting <laughs> in pretty much every. By the way, <laughs> yes. Bin Laden's mother, or Osama Bin Laden's mother, uh, an Alawite from Syria, which I learned. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm very curious to know the story behind that, actually. I know. she. Yeah, I, I, as am I. I think she was secular as well when she first, and she's made huh. a lot of statements like, I still love my son, uh, yeah, yeah. which respect. I, I do love You know, love. respect a mother's love. You know? Exactly. That's true. Got it. Um, Got so, yeah, well, we got, he, Bath was the intermediary here, right? Yeah, yeah. So Bath, Bath met Bush when they were in the Air National Guard. Uh, he was a he was actually a good pilot, as opposed to Bush, who was not a good pilot. HW yeah. basically identified him as a as a useful person, and he was a very useful person. And, and yeah, he became the intermediary between, um, in particular, Salem bin Laden and the Bush family. Um, and the, the the bin Ladens were early investors in a in Bush's W Bush's Arbusto Energy, mm-hmm. uh, oh, which later became a part of Harkin Energy. And, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, this like, Soros Harkin owned, was, I think, a part of it too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a, a lot of this. I mean, a lot of this is just legit oil business, right? I mean, yeah. this is how oil right. business works. I mean, this is how it works. Uh, so, if you're going to invest in oil, you're going to get invested in some of these uh, intelligence associated companies. Not to not to say that Soros isn't intelligence connected. I'm sure he probably is. Um, but yeah, so the the Bush the Bush connection goes through to to the Harkin oil deal, uh, where H W was technically the president of this company, and it it, it happened right when. Um, he became CIA director in, uh, in I guess, 78, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, they got this deal to take over, the, to, to start these offshore oil rigs, which they had no experience doing. They'd never done it before. Yeah, and they were a fairly uh, small company, too, like compared they to They were others. tiny, yeah. Yeah, totally. They were very, very small. It was, a weird, it was a weird pick. Everybody thought it was weird at the time. They didn't understand why Harkin had been picked. Obviously, it had been picked because it was very closely connected to some, some prominent American politicians. Um, so there's there's these ties that go to Saudi money between the, the Bush family and very important. I mean, the, you know, the Bin Ladens are a, a big infrastructure. Uh, the Saudi Bin Laden group's a big infrastructure construction, uh, civil engineering company. Uh, and the Bin Laden family is one of the most uh, important non-royal families in, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Along with the, the Khashoggi's would be the other the other big one. Oh, the Khashoggi's? <laughs> they have a little bit of a Mujahideen connection, too, considering the they gun do. running. And they yes. also have a have wonderful uh, Robert Maxwell Epstein connection, of too. Yes, and, sure. and, of course, the Queen connection with the song Khashoggi's Boat by Queen. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I was they, gonna, a song about- they, they have a song called Khashoggi's Boat. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Well, I was going to say it's good that you mentioned this because I do think that people, again, who aren't familiar with uh, this this history or these this cast of characters, like there is this idea that either Bin Laden is some singular figure or it's this mm-hmm. sort of like uh, rebel family or they're not, I mean, you know, they're one of the biggest dynasties in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, absolutely, and even like the uh, the like New Yorker version of the mainstream story is that uh, Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden, was like the black sheep of the right. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. at all. His family disowned uh, which, him in the nineties, right, which is not true. At you know, maybe they uh, officially disowned him or whatever, but it's, it's you know everything that he was doing with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, 
uh, was totally fine with them. I mean, he brought Saudi Absolutely. Bin Laden Group construction equipment with him. He used build. trucks. He used yeah. branded trucks of his companies. Yeah. Like, and it's not like it was in Pakistan, right? Yeah. And by the yeah. way, the Bin Laden company also, I think, didn't Osama built, blew up some barracks, right? Yeah, there was a barracks bombing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, well, yeah. check out who rebuilt the barracks, the Bin Laden construction <laughs> yeah. group. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is that they also do totally legit stuff. Like yeah, they're yeah. building the metro system in in the UAE. You know, yep. like <laughs> which must just, be insane to be like ride the subway to work in the UAE. <laughs> and it's like Bin Laden yeah. construction. No, but just like all the seats are just like uh, Filipino slaves oh. that you bring. I know it's fucked. I'm not yeah. even making a joke about that. That shit pisses no, me is, off. Like, it yeah, it's no really. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But this so, is the kind of you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the connections between the Bush, but the Bush family, and then specifically the Bin Laden family, are quite close as well. Not just like the Saudis in general. Yeah, definitely. Because I think it sounds, if you say like Bush did nine eleven, it sounds kind of absurd. Like on the and yet, because you're <laughs> like, he's you, alive, dude. He like wasn't in the plane. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. And he's not a good. He stopped flying in the mid seventies. Exactly. He wasn't. Well, that's. I mean, it did hit a building. That's <laughs> Maybe it was all an that's accident. That's true. That's about part for the course. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 mocked. It's like saying it's like oh, well, yeah, I mean, Bush did nine eleven, whatever. Right. You know, like I, it's you sound they kind of treat you like you're you're uh, a wingnut or something. But right. I mean, there are yeah. very real. There's not like most people have never met anyone in the Bin Laden family, yes. right? right? Like I don't think anyone listening to this has ever gone into business with a Bin. Laden. By the way, Salem Bin Laden, which you mentioned earlier, he died in a plane crash in Texas. <laughs> Yes. As did and, his father. <laughs> yes. And, and you know, he was a good pilot. The the witnesses who were there were like, yeah, he just kind of crashed into the ground for some reason. Like, there's yeah. no obvious reason why it happened. It was not a mechanical issue. It, I mean, you can look, go look up the NTSB report. It's just a it's just pilot error. Is what it's I, I, would, I would like to mention uh, a certain other famous person died in a plane crash, uh, Lin Bao of China. <laughs> And I think there's also some things that people should look into there. I've been I've been reading a lot of his works and getting really yeah uh, yeah uh, San Francisco Red Guard baby. Uh, mm-hmm. Speaking of ISI, I think they're funded by the ISI. But uh, so so yeah, I mean they have they have a ton a ton ton of connections and a lot of them through the Carlisle Group too, right? Yeah. So the the Carlisle Group is is kind of semi Twitter famous, I guess, uh, yes. for a weird reason. <laughs> uh, but the yeah the Carlisle Group is a uh, again by all appearances a legit uh, financial services company. Um, one of those ones that's not quite a hedge fund, not quite like wealth management. So not sure what exactly it's it is. It's just like a money company. Yeah. It's just a money, co- it's, it's just money they, incorporated. Everything, everything gets lumped into just calling it private equity, and no one wants right. to even question, like, what is that? So they just go, oh, it's private equity, and they move on yeah. with their day. Yeah. And that's what that's what Carlisle is, except that Carlisle has, for example, H.W. Bush was on the, the board, uh, very and lots of very senior Pentagon uh, intelligence connected people on the leadership. Oof, James uh, Baker. Yeah, his the yeah. ex World Bank Prez. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of lots and lots of people like that, uh, and uh, members of the Bin Laden family were were very senior, uh, and and had money invested through Carlisle. We love it. We and love actually, it. Actually, actually, the the morning of nine eleven uh, was a meeting uh, with. Carlisle Group directors and some other senior people in Carlisle Group, and among those in attendance were members of the Bin Laden family and George H. W. Bush. We love it. We absolutely yeah. love it. Um, yeah, it's uh, they were actually about like I think like three weeks after nine eleven, there was a news story that was like uh, the Bin Laden family is withdrawing some funds from the Carlisle mm-hmm. Group <laughs> because mm-hmm. the Carlisle Group they are not just like a a hub for uh, you know just bloodthirsty freaks and pedophiles. They also own a lot of. De- they own defense companies. They own famously Bofors, yeah, which makes yes. the Bofors gun. Uh, it's I think they're Swedish, but uh, they own United Defense, which makes the Bradley mm-hmm. fighting vehicle. And so there was. I mean, there is an entirely not only a real possibility. There is a giant possibility that the Bradleys that the Americans fought in 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 Afghanistan and later were like the, the money made from purchasing those went to some of the Bin Ladens, which is really funny. Yeah. And of yeah, course, Bush. Totally. totally. Yeah, Carlisle is basically funding the war in Yemen right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and it's like it's. They also it's, just bought Supreme. They bought Supreme. 
Oh my god. Listeners, I'm pretty sure no I should double check. We're that. no longer giving out supreme discount codes on our store. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. So so the Carlisle group, I mean, we, we just mentioned 911, this meeting that they were having. Let's talk about let's 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 look at a little bit about the road to 911. So what was Al Qaeda? What were they up to? By the way, we listeners will Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. Listeners will astute listeners will know that that means the base in Arabic. <laughs> Um, but well, yeah. Talk to me. Talk, lay, lay some Qaeda facts on me. What's going on with Qaeda uh, and yeah. the road to nine eleven? So what, what was what was Osama up to after the uh, you know this, uh, the the eighties have passed? We are now uh, we have moved from cocaine. Now we are doing meth. Uh, <laughs> bell bottoms after the return are once again out in in favor of long baggy shorts. Uh, and and so what's going on with Osama during this time? Yeah, well, actually, uh, yeah, Osama's Osama's uh, very brief dip uh, during that time period definitely mimics the transition from uh, cocaine go go eighties. Mm-hmm. You know, the money the money stopped flowing, so Union was gone. Definitely, definitely, there was a ton of still involvement from the GID, the ISI, the CIA. It definitely was, but it was much less than it had been. Um, he he got kicked out of Saudi Arabia. He had to he moved to Sudan briefly. Um, and then ends up finding his, himself in Afghanistan. Uh, and all the while, he's being protected uh, by the CIA, by the FBI, as well as, as by the GID and the ISI. And one of the, one of the people who, because there is a, so uh, it's very interesting the way that it gets branded. Because uh, obviously Al-Qaeda is not the Mujahideen. They're not the same thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, exactly. But it's, it's definitely a continuation in a lot of respects. In particular, you know, uh, we just talked about Osama bin Laden was was building infrastructure for the Mujahideen. Yeah, um, I mean, and that's you, sorry if I can interrupt real quick. I mean, a lot of that sort of global jihadist infrastructure was built during the Afghan Soviet War. Yeah, financed totally. by Saudi Arabia uh, via, or excuse me, by the CIA via Saudi Arabia. And so, like a lot of this infrastructure that came in later into play. I mean, the, the Yugoslav Wars saw this yep. infrastructure used. Like, I mean, yep. this was this was this is when it became a thing, basically. Yeah. Totally, and and um, and Osama bin Laden was was very, you know, he was like a. In addition to doing infrastructure, he was also a bag man. He was sort of distributing money to people. Yep. Um, and that that sort of financial network became, uh, I mean, Al Qaeda means the base, and that's sort of what it was. It was like this financial, uh, this whole set, set of financial networks. Uh, some of them in the U.S. I mean, there was a whole cell operating in Brooklyn. Uh, one of the more, probably one of the more important um, connections is this guy Ali Mohammed. Um, and he had been, he, uh, I mean, the, the documentation is pretty sketchy, but it seems like probably he was started off as an Egyptian intelligence officer. Uh, he became a trainer of the trainers, so he would go to uh, the U.S. Army's Special Warfare School in, in North Carolina. He would oh, learn from SOCOM how to do guerrilla warfare, how to do that kind of thing. He would go back to Afghanistan, train people in Afghanistan, and then go back to the United States. And he did several of these trips. I, I've um, also made some of the, and it's a grueling trip, so I've done it <laughs> myself. It's difficult. Yeah, it's a long, that's a long flight from Charlotte to uh, Kabul. <laughs> yeah. Not a, yeah, you're going to want to have a drink on that one. And he was, yeah, he was, he was one of the people who trained, I mean, he trained the 11 hijackers how to hijack planes. Um, so he, and he <laughs> got that information, at least some of it from his time at, at SOCOM. Uh, during the 90s, there was this whole cell in Brooklyn that Ali Mohammed was an important part of. Um, Omar Abdel Rahman, the so-called blind sheikh, was also mm. an Egyptian, uh, and he was an important part of this. Um, you know, they were involved in the 93 World Trade Center bombing, uh, which one of the people who was who was blowing that building up, Ahmad Salem, uh, was an FBI informant and, right. and was telling the FBI about this whole plan. Um, uh, that becomes a reoccurring theme, as we'll see when we move into stuff. Is that the FBI, like the authorities, had lots of tips about what's going on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's. I mean, it's important. It's not just. A, it's in some cases, it's not clear why they didn't tell anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but in some cases, it's very clear. It's. It's obviously. But when we talk about nine eleven specifically, there's obvious instances where it's a very clearly an organized conspiracy of a fairly small number of people who right. are intentionally concealing information. It's not just uh, incompetence. It's it's absolutely they knew what was coming and they chose to protect uh, certain people for, mm-hmm. for for whatever reason. Uh, and yeah, that like you say, that's a that's something that goes way way back. You know, the ninety eight uh, uh, mm-hmm. Ali Muhammad was very important in the ninety eight embassy bombings. He was one of the people who was um, uh, he was observing 
uh, and and collecting. He was basically casing the joint for these these two embassies in Tanzania and, and Kenya. Yep. Um, and he, the NSA knew that that was going to happen. You know, they had intercepts. Uh, they were they were bugging a phone in Yemen, which we we'll, uh, we might talk about later. But they were bugging this phone in this in this Al Qaeda operations center, and they they must, I mean, you know, we don't know for sure, but they they must have heard. Uh, these conversations between these people that we know took place. Yeah, um, and they didn't do anything. And a ton, you know, I mean, the, the, those were those ones obviously get overshadowed by nine eleven. It was much right. Nine eleven was much bigger, but those were at the time those were very significant events. Uh, and the fact that that, for example, the NSA knew about it uh, and didn't take any steps. So again, like you say, the intelligence agencies knew about nine eleven. They didn't do anything about it. Well, actually, this has happened a bunch of different times, and there's obvious evidence of it happening several different times. So it's not a one-off, not a one-off event for sure. And I think I think that we sort of see that happen with with a lot of these sort of newer, you know, lone gunmen, or mm. sometimes in the case, I think the LA shooters, dual gunmen attacks. Is that I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, if we're just going from past evidence, and especially if we take a look at something like the Boston bombing, mm. is that they do know this stuff is going to happen. And sometimes they swoop in. I mean, they, they they are often the people that cause this stuff to happen. I mean, in the case of that guy in upstate New York, with the, I think it was upstate New York, with the knife that they had to go buy him to drive and stuff like that. They had to go drive to buy him and stuff like that. Like, is they'll they'll sort of trick these either mentally ill or just really alienated, isolated people into to planning quote unquote planning this attack, and then they'll stop them at the last minute. And look, they saved an innocence, an untold amount of innocence from a terrorist attack. I think sometimes. In the case of, of, of certain people, maybe a little Mandalay Bay, they let it happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean the you know, you mentioned Boston bombers. Definitely, like Sarniev, uh, hit, you know their their dad was uh, had CIA connections. Was connected yes. to this program that Graham Fuller was running. And, and again, those those back to those Central Asian uh, yep. Soviet republics. Um, so that yeah, absolutely. I mean it's a it's a long long running thing. A lot of history. A lot of examples of it. Uh, so it's definitely not a one-off, isolated incident. So just to quickly recap, because we do have to wrap up in a little bit um, before we, you know, dive into the next part. But um, I kind of want to just give, like, not uh, not a recap, but I just want to kind of explain, like, why it was important to give this background before we got into, like, you know, whatever, you know, kind of like what everyone came to see, which is, like, the actual 9-11 yeah. uh, stuff. <laughs> But I do think that, like, it was really important for us to kind of go through all these different connections and histories, and we didn't even get into a lot, but just to kind of um, paint a picture for people, you know, you know who the major players are in this region, why, I mean, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the episode, but, like, why this region is so important, um, you know, not just to U.S. interests, but, like, kind of throughout, you, you know, 20th century history, it's been, you know, contentious with a lot of different state actors. Yeah. And just kind of like, you know, so everyone can kind of see or kind of picture, you know, you've got the Bin Ladens and the Bushes and the CIA and history and with the Soviets in Afghanistan. And um, I don't know, I think painting that picture is really important for people to understand what comes next. Yeah, I think it, I mean, it gets viewed at, Obviously, it was a very significant thing that affected a lot of people, so right. it, it jumps to the top of people's psyches. But it is it is not the beginning of so- something. Right? It is not the beginning of American involvement in that region. It is not the beginning of American covert operations in that region. It is part of a very long history of not just American, uh, but just kind of the general. I mean, oil, drugs, these are extremely important for the modern economy, uh, and uh, the continued American involvement, I mean, essentially 9-11 was effectively a media event. And we, we'll talk about anthrax uh, yeah. probably later, I guess. But, mm-hmm. but the whole point of it was to create this media event to allow the continuation of this ongoing uh, American involvement in the region. And all these people like Hekmatyar and Bush, obviously, all these people show up uh, both in this early period and then when 9-11 actually happens, they're, they're the same people are involved in the whole thing. Yeah, we should also mention Cheney and Rumsfeld as well, because those are big guys that we're going to have yes. to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that have not talk about them. Yeah, they're long, they also have long, long histories in U.S. Yes. government yes. <laughs> and intelligence. Um, and the Pentagon, obviously. Um, cool. This has 
a lot of this stuff was blowing my mind. I can't wait to get into the next part, which is when my I put on my real full truther hat, which mm-hmm. Brace hates when I put that on. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm, I'm so psyched. ready. Man, the masses are not ready for the pill that we are about to <laughs> shove down their throats. We watched a lot of Jesse Ventura today. <laughs> nice. Nice. I really like him. He's I'm crazy. glad he sued the American Sniper's wife. Dude, I can't believe Wait, the what? American. Yeah, because oh, American t- Sniper wrote in his book that he 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 like a, you know his book was insane and had these really far yeah. claims. Yeah, we However, should maybe talk about him. I too. do want to say that I do believe that he was he shot people uh, in New Orleans as a, a Katrina. Oh, absolutely, I that. absolutely, hundred percent, very easily. Believable. We got to do a Katrina episode but because said, I don't think yeah. people understand How exactly was what was going on there as well. Yeah. Martial law, basically. Yeah. But this, no, he says in his book that he knocked out or he punched Jesse Ventura at a bar because Jesse Ventura, you know, is <laughs> you know, this like right. character. Jesse Ventura, of course, he was a he was a SEAL in the Vietnam War, yeah. uh, which he has uh, uh, later turned again. I like Jesse. Uh, but that he made, but American Cyper made that up. Like it never that 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 <laughs> incident never occurred. And Jesse Ventura got all pissed and sued him and wow. won because it never happened. However, by the time that he won the lawsuit, American Sniper had uh, been killed by a mm. uh, listener of the show uh, <laughs> at a gun range. I love taking my mentally insane, like, child killer friends to the gun range, Yeah. by the way. I mean, it's just like, Jesus Christ. These people are like, make fun of people for being triggered. Literally, the American Sniper got killed because the guy was triggered. <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. because of, you know, weapons Allegedly. and such. Allegedly. Yeah. Well, who knows? I mean, but, I was just thinking, like, can you imagine how, like, I, oh, now I'm just getting angry thinking about Katrina and Bush and how little, like, like how everything has been washed away in memory of how fucking insane the Bush administration yeah. was. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if Trump literally just had martial law running through an entire, Man. like, city in... Like uh, I, I, a I just, hugely black city in the south, yeah. I mean, it's fucking insane. They, they massacred people. Yeah. Like there's literally, yeah. Well, anyway, sorry. <laughs> it just like makes me so angry that the like hagiography yeah. of fucking George W. Bush. I know. I, I I don't think maybe maybe younger people can't understand, even though we're not like old by any. No. Means, but, like it's insane that George Bush was even rehabilitated yeah. a little bit and everybody who's doing that yeah. even in like kind of a meme way well I don't know but like uh, the guy should be in jail I mean the guy yeah, should be absolutely in, he sh- there should be a war crimes tribunal like there's no question yeah it'll never happen in a million years but it no. should be yeah I mean well they said I think it was Bush actually who put in place the plans to invade yes. the Hague if anyone's yeah. ever by, by the way yeah America has plans to invade the Hague if any American soldiers books. are ever put uh put there for a war crimes tribunal. But yeah. they're not going to... I mean, there are a lot of black people in the army, and they only, you know, b- prosecute black people at the ICC. But sure. it's, you know, we'll see. Well, except for one. Yeah, I mean... Most of it is black. I mean, a lot of the blame for that, I think, is on Obama. And that's something I could never, ever forgive that entire, whatever we want to call it, administration for. Um, yeah. Just fucking despicable people. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Ben. <laughs> always a pleasure, uh, even though this is technically the first time. So I'm just saying in the future, this will always be a pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah, if people listen to it in the wrong order, it'll make sense. <laughs> yeah. And uh, looking forward to part two. That'll be real fun. I am too. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. Good night. Sorry, let me get off the phone real quick. Hey, no, no, I'll call you back. That was nobody. Who was it? That was the FBI. Yeah, because they, they, we had some technical difficulties while we were recording because mm-hmm. little, you know, you always got to have your Snowden brain on, and we didn't mm-hmm. when we were talking about this stuff. Remember they turned off the lights when he was doing that interview? Yeah, and they put... Okay, wait, you've seen the movie, right? I have not. You haven't seen Citizen 4? No. Oh, everyone? I've only seen Citizen 1 through 3. Mm-hmm. And Kane, the prequel. That's so funny. Um, Young Chauncey's laughing. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Now you're laughing, too. At your dumb face. That's two out of three. Okay, go on. So, everyone at home and everyone sitting on this couch right here, Brace Belden, mm-hmm. should watch Citizen 4. Mm-hmm. As it's, uh, you know, if you don't know about... <laughs> uh, 
you know, the tech overreach in surveillance mm-hmm. capabilities, then you should probably find out. But uh, when they're in, when Greenwald is there, when Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras are there interviewing Snowden at this hotel in Hong Kong, he's like, hold on. And, you know, they're interviewing him. He's under a blanket. Everyone's phone is in the, like, mini fridge. Yeah. He's unplugged everything. Yeah. And it really, like, impresses on you. Oh, shit. I don't know shit about OPSEC. Well, here's the thing. If you are, like, I know a lot of people use, like, Signal to talk to other people or something like that. If you're actually having a face-to-face meeting with another person, first of all, have it near no things that can transmit or be transmitted. And get yourself a Faraday case, which is a case that blocks. I have a bunch at home, and I have one with me right now. It blocks everything coming in and out of your phone. And put it so put your phone in a Faraday case and put it in the other room. Mm-hmm. I think the fridge thing works too. I've had we people just tried do that it with me. the other day. Remember, you gave it to me and put oh, my phone yeah, in, yeah, and then yeah. you called it, and uh, I, I, it was, I was about so to say, weird. Great magic trick to impress women too. You're like, <laughs> check out this magical case I bought. It's like a purse. I just, you know, I found it a little impressive. There we go, baby. Okay. So, uh, so we're coming back. Mm-hmm. We got more, like we said, we got a lot more to talk about with Ben. Mm-hmm. We that gotta was actually Desert Storm. And and think of our next episode as the Iraq War. Yeah, Iraqi freedom. And then we'll have a surge. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's so much more to get into. I'm yeah, like I said, I got a lot of tinfoil hats to put on. Yeah. I am really about to go off. I think this is the most reading I've done for an episode. Because I know all the Epstein stuff really well. Mm. So this is like, and I know this stuff too, but there's so much of it. Like, there's, like, the anthrax guy's letters and all that stuff. I, I have to, like, I start going down one thing. I have to get into everything. It's very, I've, I've been, I'll tell you what, have not had a lot of social conduct contact in the past week. <laughs> this is why that rules, though. Yeah, I know. Keep me off the streets. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for another, uh, well, I'm not really, you know what? I'm not thanking you guys. We did all the work. <laughs> thank you guys. Okay, okay. I think that I'd like to thank you guys for doing this with me. Thanks, Brace. Yeah. Don't say my name on here. Okay. Well, I'm Liz. My name is Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, we are joined, of course, by my faithful sat rap who is in charge of large swaths of Southwest Asia, Young Chomsky. <laughs> and we are Truanon. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye.